Hello, and so glad that you have chosen to join us for worship on this second Sunday of Lent. There's a lot, as always, going on in the life of the church. The biggest news is that our church council did decide this past Tuesday that it is time, it is safe enough for us to begin to get ready to open up for worship in person. So our first in-person Sunday worship service will be on Sunday, the 21st of March. We are in the process of doing everything that we need to do to ensure that that will be a safe experience. So I encourage you to continue to look at our newsletter and our website to get all the news that you need about the times of worship. Things will be a little bit different with the contemporary service being at 10 o'clock instead of 11 o'clock, just to have fewer people in the building at the same time. We recognize that everyone may not agree with this decision. Everyone may not be comfortable coming and worshiping in person at this time. So we will also be starting an outdoor worship service, which will be meeting at 1 o'clock on Sundays. Again, wait for information about when that will happen. And we also recognize that even that might not feel safe to some people. So we will continue to be an online presence as well. And our hope is that you will find a way to worship God and to deepen your faith, whether that is in person or in lo- online. So now I invite you to open your hearts and your minds to God as we prepare to worship.
please join us now in our call to worship. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent. Towards the one who calls us each by name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us. Acknowledging our fears, our doubts, and our longings. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us. And whose ways were made manifest in the good news called Jesus. Come, let us worship God. Let us each take up our cross and follow Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now I invite you to join me in affirming our Christian faith. I believe in an innovative God who does not wait for us to find ourselves, but comes seeking the lost and calling us into a new way. I believe in Jesus of Nazareth of, as God's crucial initiative, that when He calls us to follow, Christ also gives us the power to become, both in creed and deed, the children of the living God. I believe in the Spirit by whom Jesus still comes to us, calling us to follow Him into an obedience which is true liberty, and a, a humble service which is the fruit of holy friendship. I believe in the church as the fellowship of Christ's people, called to respect and support one another through joys and tribulations as we travel the road toward the promised land of God's future. Because Christ has called me. In this I truly believe. Amen. And now let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not been sincere Christians. We claim to follow Jesus, but have not taken the path of sacrificial love. We profess to be disciples but we are not willing to bear the cost of discipleship. We affirm the virtue of self-denial, but we indulge our selfish desires and seek earthly gain. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for sincere repentance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Scripture says that when, when we are sincere and, and seek forgiveness, ask God to forgive us, then God is faithful 
and offers that forgiveness to us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? 
Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit of God, please guard each and every thought and grant that we may always watch for your light, listen to your voice, and follow your gracious inspirations. Amen. Take up your cross and follow me. What a famous line. I mean, it's even made it into colloquial conversation. Everyone has their cross to bear. Christians and non-Christians alike are say. But what exactly does it mean? Well, the simple answer is clear. No one gets off scot-free. Everyone must suffer sometime. And while this is true, it doesn't really answer the personally relevant question. Because the question that matters in our lives right now is, what is my cross? What might I be called to do that is not easy? And should I avoid this burden or willingly embrace it? How we answer these questions affects our day-to-day -day lives and our faith. In seeking answers, I find that returning to Scripture can help. Now, one very important aspect to help us better understand today's reading is to know what occurs right before today's excerpt. Just two verses earlier, in response to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, Peter attains the Star Pupil Award for having declared Jesus as the Messiah. But, unfortunately for him and his cohort, what follows is a clarification of just what this Messiahship entails, and therefore, by implication, the nature of true discipleship. And this clearly was not what Peter had in mind. Expecting the Messiah to be the answer to their problems, released from the misery of Roman occupation, they certainly did not want to hear Jesus saying that he must undergo great suffering and be killed. In response to Jesus' unwelcome pronouncement, Peter the rock of the church, has the audacity to rebuke said Messiah. Peter has gone from star pupil to the one standing in the corner for reasons which we probably all can relate to. He wanted release from suffering for himself and for his people. He didn't want to see the one in whom he had put all of his faith suffer and be killed. And who can blame him for that? Especially when we remember that he is going through all of this without knowing the end of the story, the reality, the power, and the glory of resurrection. What this points out is that most of us, like Peter, do simply do not like the idea of suffering. And we think of pain and suffering and death as bad things, things to be avoided perhaps at any cost. And while I am mostly on with him on this, and certainly I'm not going to glorify unnecessary suffering, I am challenging the idea that suffering is always to be avoided, simply because this is not what Jesus did. Jesus was willing to walk the path that included betrayal, pain, and execution. Jesus was willing to pay, take this path, but I also believe, even though this means jumping way ahead in our story, it is also important to consider that while Jesus was willing to take this route, he didn't want to. Remember, right before his arrest, while praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked, may this cup be taken from me. And again, who could blame him? 
Who would want to go through the horrors that laid ahead? So I'm going to ask perhaps an unorthodox question. But have you ever wondered what would have happened if Jesus had been more like Jonah? And when God called him to Jerusalem, instead of going, he had just slipped out the back door and headed to Rome or Egypt or perhaps some quiet little town on the Sea of Galilee and spent the next 40 years fishing for fish instead of for men? Similarly, have you ever wondered, dared to imagine Mary saying, thanks, Gabriel, for the honor, but you know, honestly, this isn't really what I had in mind, and I'd rather not put myself and my family through this humiliation, so thanks, but no thanks. What would God have done if she had turned down the invitation? Did God's plan require her to consent? Or what if, in fact, she had said yes, and then Joseph, understandably hurt and angry, stemming from Mary's apparent infidelity, had acted on his legal rights and had her stoned? How would the course of human history have been different if Jesus, Mary, or Joseph had responded as a typical person would have? and turned away from the discomfort, humiliation, from great fear and pain. If Jesus had simply been a great teacher and had not been killed, crucified, if he had not been resurrected, I don't think that I would be talking about him right now. And I ask you to consider, how would your life be different if there was no such thing as Christianity. Well, as we all know, this is not what Jesus did. And in spite of paying the ultimate price, he bravely did not turn away from what God was asking of him. Neither did Mary, neither did Joseph. Being righteous people, they all had their sights on something much bigger, and they were willing to walk down an extremely challenging road. Simply put, unlike Peter, they had their minds set not on human things, but on divine things. They were willing to sacrifice their comfort and their hopes, and Jesus, his very life, for the greater good, for that which God was calling them to do. I believe that each one of us needs to ask ourselves, what would it take for us to be so courageous? And what is God calling us to do that will be challenging, uncomfortable, scary, or perhaps downright painful? Perhaps forgiving someone who has deeply betrayed you. Maybe admitting that you have made a very big mistake. Perhaps acknowledging that you have had a thought, attitude, or maybe even an action that, when you're honest, is not very kind, is not exactly neighborly. Or perhaps you are being called right now outside of your comfort zone to have a conversation or to take a path that makes you a bit anxious just thinking about it. Well, last week, Mark asked us to reflect, are we being faithful to our call to follow Jesus? Are we being honest about our fears? I confess that when I initially got my calling, my first thought was, who do you think you are? that God would be calling you into ministry. Well, it didn't help that when I was speaking on the phone to a friend of mine and I told her about this, I was met with total silence on the other end. And during this silence, all of my fears and my doubts started swirling around and just flooded my mind again. Who did I think I was? And then my friend, with whom I had shared my vocational struggles, answered, 
Why didn't we think of this earlier? The path ahead was not easy. I mean, who in their late 40s wants to embark on an 81-hour master's degree, knowing that the challenges that this would put on one's family? And yet, while praying about this and sharing my doubts and my concerns with God, I heard God ask me, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And I knew that the answer was yes. And so many valleys and many peaks later, here I am. So yes, following Jesus can be a challenge. It will not always be easy. And thankfully, each one of us has our own path, our own cross to bear, and our paths are likely much, much easier than Joseph's or Mary's or certainly Jesus's. But in case you still aren't convinced that it's worth it, let us return to our scripture one last time. As we heard, Jesus called the crowd with his disciples. So right now he's speaking to everyone, not just the chosen few. And said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Well, in trying to understand this, it can also be helpful to look at several different translations. The New King James translation, and please excuse the masculine focus that we find in this, asks, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Ah, this is what we're talking about, not just our lives, but our souls. Jesus is putting worldly goals, values, and desires up against spiritual ones. As the contemporary English version puts it, what will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? Our true self is not our physical earthly self, but our spiritual self, our souls, for that is the part of us that lives forever. Remember, we were made in the image and likeness of God. Thus, we were made to set our minds on divine things, not on human things. But we have also each been given a choice to focus on the short term, the physical, the earthly. Or we can embrace our spiritual nature, our true selves, our very souls, which entails being willing to take up our cross, at times taking the challenging road, the path of suffering. But in so doing, we, not, we do not walk away from Christ, but we walk with Christ. And in so doing, we find our true selves and the path of life. And for this, I say, thanks be to God. So what I am suggesting is that we each take this time of Lent to be honest with ourselves, with other people, but most importantly with God. May we take time to bravely listen for God's call and to trust that in answering God's invitation, we will find meaning and fulfillment, for we will be true to our calling and true to our very souls. Thanks be to God, and amen. I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, like the Apostle Peter, we do not like to hear that your path leads to suffering, rejection, and death. As your followers, we would like to skip ahead to the resurrection, to rejoice in your victory over evil and the comforts of heaven. Like Peter, 
we need to be reminded that following you means acknowledging the evil and pain in the world. Denying our desire to numb ourselves with entertainment, alcohol, and trivial busyness. And faithfully taking up our crosses, whatever they may be. We are afraid of what total dedication to you will mean for our lives. But we choose to trust you when you say that trying to gain the world will result in losing the most important part of who you desire us to be and lead to a path of spiritual devastation. We know that disciple of Christ is not a title we can wear occasionally, setting it aside when the path is difficult. We place our lives in your care and ask you to lead us, not just today, not on Sundays, but always. Use us, we pray, because we are your servants. We are not ashamed of you or your words. Send your Holy Spirit to show us the next step on our journey. And then please give us the strength and courage to take that step. Above all, we thank you for your love poured out for all people. Enable each of us to be a witness and representative of that love to others in the coming week. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, whom we name as Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now go forth in peace, trusting in God's goodness as we move into the world and as we bravely and courageously answer God's call, trusting that when we do so, our, not only our hearts, but our souls will find meaning and fulfillment. Go in peace, trust in the God of love.